Reasonable people can disagree. People who have the same education and the same information can and will always will come to different conclusions about really fundamental topics. And that just because people disagree with you or you disagree with them or they disagree with you doesn't mean they're bad people. Doesn't mean you actually disagree. Again, usually what that reflects is that you have seen the world through a different lens. You have different experiences and you value different things in life. A question asked courageously, answered honestly, and lived authentically can change your whole life. For me, that question was, how can I use what I have, what I love, and what I know to bless the lives of others? The School for Good Living and this podcast are one answer to that question. Hi, I'm Brian Miller. I know that the world can work for everyone, but that it won't until it works for you. I've created this to help you make the difference you were born to make. It's a series of conversations with thought leaders who are moving humanity forward. And in each episode, I explore their lives and the work they do. I also ask them to break down how they've gotten their books written, published, and read. This podcast is all about exploring the magic and mystery, and sometimes the misery, of the creative process. So if you have a mission, a message, and the motivation to share it, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. My guest today is Morgan Housel, author of The Psychology of Money, Timeless Lessons on Wealth, Greed, and Happiness. Morgan is a former columnist at The Motley Fool and The Wall Street Journal. He's presented at more than 100 conferences in a dozen countries. He speaks about behavioral finance and history. He's an incredible storyteller, helps us deal with risk, think about risk, think about money, think about life. We talk about the highest form of wealth. We talk about money's greatest intrinsic value. We talk about so many surprising facts about finance and money in the United States, especially. We talk about how to build wealth without having a high income, how to make more intelligent financial decisions. And we talk about some of the economic and social dynamics underneath the unrest that our country, the United States, is experiencing and what to expect in the future. I love this book. I think it absolutely will be a bestseller. Nothing in this book is particularly complicated, but that's part of its brilliance is that Morgan is able to explain things that are right in front of us that we might not have known what we were truly seeing or opportunity that was available to us or pitfalls to avoid. The one that he starts with is about a guy who instructs people at the hotel where he's working to go buy gold coins and then he skips them into the ocean for fun. It's pretty easy to see that's a bad economic decision. But beyond that, he points out some of the subtler lessons we can apply, again, to build more wealth and have a greater quality of life. Morgan is a partner at the Collaborative Fund, and you can learn more by visiting morganhousel.com. That's H-O-U-S-E-L or collaborativefund.com. If you haven't already discovered Morgan and his work, I hope you enjoy and benefit from, from this as much as I did. Please enjoy this conversation with my new friend, Morgan Housel. Morgan, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad you are. Morgan, will you tell me, please, what's life about? I think what life is about, A, is different for various people and at different points in your life. There's this theory in psychology that I, I really like called the end of history illusion, which says that people are keenly aware of how much they have changed in the past, but everyone tends to underestimate how much they will change in the future. So if you are in your 30s, you can look back and recognize that you are a very different person than you were in your 20s. But if you were to look ahead to your 40s or your 50s, you tend to think, I'm going to be the same person. 10 years from now, I'm going to have the same desires. I'm going to have the same philosophies, the same outlooks. But of course you won't. You will probably change as much over the next 10 or 20 years as you did over the last 10 or 20 years, which is just to say that what you want out of life, what is meaningful to you in life is going to change. What was important to me when I was 20 is obviously very different than now that I am 36, completely different. And then if you were to fast forward 14 years when I'm 50, I'm sure that what will be meaningful to me then will be very different. If you have kids, I have a, my oldest, we have two kids, our oldest is four years old. So just what is been important to me in life and what life is all about has drastically changed over the last four years. So that is what I think it's, it's, it's really about. That's the first point is that it's different for everyone. The second point, if you were to just phrase that question differently in terms of how do you define success? That's a more, it's, it's maybe a different point, but let's run with it. My best, the definition that I like the most about success comes from Warren Buffett, who says success is when the people who you want to have love you do love you. 
And that's really important because so much of what we do in life is outward appearance for strangers. Whether it is the stuff that we buy, the appearance that we put forth, it is more or less trying to impress strangers who don't care about you and aren't thinking about you. So I, I try to keep that in mind a lot, that Look, it's not that I don't care about outward appearance. It's not that whatsoever. But who do I really want to love me in life? Well, my kids, my wife, my parents, my very close friends, I desperately care about what they think of me. Their impression of me, are they proud of me? That is so important to me. But other people, it's not necessarily that I don't care about their view of me. It's just that they're not thinking about me. Everyone thinks that other people are thinking about you more than they are. And no one is thinking about you more than you are. So I always try to keep that in mind that if there's, if you just have your crew, your very few people around you, your spouse, maybe your kids, your parents, whoever it is, and really desperately care about what they think of you and try to not put much effort into other people. That I think is a way to kind of set yourself on a path for life that is going to be meaningful to you regardless of where you are in life. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes so much sense. And as I understand from your new book, this psychology of money, timeless lessons on wealth, greed, and happiness, that there's a way in which what you're saying, you know, this, there's a humility and an awareness of the ego that you talk about is if we, if we become aware of that and we use that intentionally is a way we can create wealth, right? By not spending to what the ego would have us spend to. But right, will you talk a right. little bit about how do you, how do you describe that? Or how do you talk about that? Well, I write in the book that, you know, your savings rate, which is what which is what defines your wealth, just how much you are saving, regardless of what your income is, your savings rate for many people that are above the, you know, the basic poverty line, your savings rate is the gap between your income and your ego. It's just how much are you making and how much are you able to suppress your desire to spend what you're making largely in able in order to impress other people, whether that's a nice car or a nice house or nice clothes, all of which I like, by the way, I'm not, I'm not arguing people should live like a monk, but I think it's just really important that, you know, the amount that you save, which is going to determine your wealth is just your ability to say, I could buy a nicer car. I could have a nicer house. I could have a Rolex, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to suppress that ego and save the money instead to build wealth. And the reason, this is a somewhat different point, but the reason I want wealth is to control my time, to have a level of independence that's going to let me pursue what I want to do, to have control over my calendar, not necessarily in a material possession way, even though I like nice cars and nice homes as much as anyone else. Yeah. Well, and that was one of my biggest takeaways from your book, what you called the highest form of wealth. And you write, the highest form of wealth is the ability to wake up every morning and say, I can do whatever I want today. <laughs> That's it. And look, yeah. the important part takeaway from that is that for most people, what they want to do every day is wake up and do good productive work. So the ability to, to control your time does not mean that you are necessarily going to retire early. Maybe it is for some people. But I think if there is one kind of flaw in the FIRE movement, financial independence recently, it's that most people don't want to retire. They want to be very productive members of society. They want to wake up every Monday morning and go to work at 8 o'clock. But if you can do that on your own terms, though, and live where you want to, work with whom you want to, for the company that you want to, that's doing work that is really meaningful to you, without just having to have the only metric that you focus on is maximizing your income, if you can really focus on maximizing your time and what you want to do, that is something that will give people a more enduring level of happiness, more meaningful level of happiness, than I think anything that we can buy in the physical world will. You know, it's not that, you know, people who have very nice cars and very nice homes, it's not that those things don't make them happier, but there's not a lot of evidence that those people are any happier or have better days than people who don't drive Lamborghinis and, and live in huge mansions. But people who do control their times, do control their calendar, are demonstrably happier and have fewer bad days than people who are, you know, their, their entire day is based off of someone else's demands. And they have to go to work when someone else wants them to, do work that someone else wants them to do, work with people who someone else wants them to work with. It's just, you know, that form of being, you know, at someone else's behest is a really difficult thing. Whereas I think independence and independence exists on a spectrum. It's not just having so much money that you can retire whenever you want to. That's one level. But independence is a spectrum of if you have enough savings that you can withstand a, a, a medical emergency, or if you get laid off and you can take your time to pick a better job that you move to next, rather than having to take the first one that you can find because you're so desperate. That's a level of independence that exists on the spectrum that I think is really important for people. Yeah, I, I agree. Who did you write this book for and what did you want it to do for them? Well, that, it's, a, it's a great question about, about writing because I've always liked this idea of what I call selfish writing, 
which is a way that I, I don't feel guilty about, but I am writing for myself. And what I mean by that is I only want to write something that I am personally interested in and seems interesting to me because that's when I think I will do my best work. As soon as I, as soon as I sit down at my desk and I say, what would somebody else want to read? What would they find interesting that I can put in front of them? Then I feel like you're doing work for other people. And doing work for other people, it's not that it's bad, but it's not as fun as doing work for yourself. Writing for yourself is fun, and I think it shows. Whereas writing for other people is work, and I think it shows. So everything that I write, I, I, I view it through the lens of an audience of one. It's just me. Is What topic am I interested in that I want to go out and research and tell a story that I think is fun or funny or interesting? And then I just take a leap of faith that if I'm interested in it, other people probably will be as well. But I never want to write anything that's not interesting to me, but I think, oh, well, other people will want to hear this, which is, I think is a really good filter for when you're writing. Every sentence that you write, if you ask yourself, hey, am I personally interested in that sentence? If you always ask yourself that, is that sentence necessary? Do I, does that sentence make me go, oh, wow, that's neat. If you're always asking yourself that question, I think it's a good filter to move towards better writing that other people will also find more interesting. No, I, I can see that. And, and I think, I mean, I, I love Kurt Vonnegut's advice about write for just one person. But it, what he does didn't he have that say, too? I mean, I, I, I don't want to pretend like I came up with that. I'm sure other people <laughs> have, but I, I, I didn't know that he had that as well. Well, what's interesting to me is he doesn't specify, is that one person yourself? Oh, interesting. <laughs> or, or is it a specific reader or, you know, a composite sort of reader or something, but always keeping the individual in mind and, and that view about if you're writing something you're personally interested in, odds are good, it's going to resonate with at least somebody else. But you talk also in here about what you wrote to your son when he was born that you, you wrote a letter and you referred to it a couple of times. What did you say to your son about money in this letter and about life in the letter you wrote him? Well, there, there was lots in, in the letter. It was, it was many different topics, but one of the things that really stand out is about judging people's success and underestimating the role of, of luck in, in life. And, you know, there are people who are born in very wealthy families, people who are born in very poor families, people who are born grew up in families that really promote education and really push going to a great school. There are people who push like the, the anti-education, like everyone has these things that are outside of your control that you have no influence over that have a huge impact on the outcome of your life. And when you really take that seriously, it just makes it, you become much more humble in judging other people and making and realizing that people who are very successful not always got there because of the decisions that they made and people who are very poor did not always get there because of the decisions that they made so be careful judging other people by their wealth including yourself there's so much other things in life that are important the other thing I, that i that i wrote about and i also wrote a letter to my daughter though she was not born when i was writing most of this book yet was that you know this kind of goes back to what we talked about before is that you might think you want a really nice car you might think you want a really nice, big, huge, glamorous house. But I'm telling you, you probably don't. What you probably want is for people to respect and admire you. And you think that by having the really nice car, the nice house, that people will admire you more. But they probably won't because most people aren't thinking about your stuff when they think about you. What really brings the respect and admiration that you probably want is the core of what you want are things that are the soft skills that have nothing to do with money. Are you a good friend? Are you a nice person? Are you helpful? Are you respectful? Are you empathetic? That's the kind of thing that brings you the respect and admiration from other people that you think that buying the nice stuff is going to get you. Mm, so insightful, both of those points. And and I love the the way you worded that first point you made to your son about not all success is due to hard work and not all poverty is due to laziness. See, yeah, it's it's better when it's written. I was trying to speak that out that, that off the fly, but thank you for reading it as it was written, because yeah. it's clearer that way. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very thoughtful. And the the whole book, you know, is thoughtful. What is it that you wish? And, and again, I know there's so much you write 200 plus pages and, and there's a lot in there you hope a reader takes away. But how do you hope a reader's life is different as a result of having read this material? I hope people become introspective about their own relationship with greed and fear. I think maybe if there's one kind of common denominator in the points I make in the book, it's that. And the, and the realization that everyone is different because we come from different areas, different backgrounds, different upbringings. We have different goals, different families, different flaws, different skills. Everyone is going to think about risk and opportunity differently. And therefore, what works for me and what I want to do with my money, the decisions that I make, might be completely backwards for you. 
and for someone else. And that's fine. I think a lot of the debates or arguments that we have about money between two people are not actually debates and arguments. They're just reflections that we have completely different goals and values in life. And it's fine that people who are equally educated, equally informed, can come to vastly different decisions about what is worth it to do with their money. And that's okay. You don't need to debate about it. It's just people have very different ways of going about it. Very similar to things in relationships where you know, what is the textbook definition of a good of a good spouse, a good a good husband, a good wife? Well, it's different for everyone. Things that I like, other people might like, and vice versa. It's all different for everyone. And we come to different conclusions about different people, and that's fine. That's okay. So I think if people can really embrace that about money, that what you need to do is find a plan that works for you, even if other people don't think it's right. And also when you're viewing how other people do with their money, if you disagree with it, well, that's okay. If it works for someone else, leave them alone. That's what works for them. That's their life. That's fine. Is something that I think is really important about money. No, that that makes so much sense. And in a couple of things you you say in the book that, you know, I don't they'd never occurred to me before a few things. One of them was about playing a different game. Like people are playing different games with money. You know, the day trader is playing a very different game from somebody who has a long term perspective. And therefore, of course, their behavior is different. And we sometimes approach investing or money management as though there should be a single set of rules. But there, of course there's not. Yeah, we all think that we are quote unquote investors and we're all playing the same game in, in the sense that like we're all playing football that has the same rules, the same strategies, the same plays. That's kind of how we think intuitively about investing in the stock market. But of course, that's not right. There are from day traders to people who are, you know, pension funds that are investing for the next century. And, and the, the thing that's difficult is that we're all playing on the same field. There's only one stock market. We're all playing the same field. We're looking at the same prices, the same information, even though we're playing different games. And so when you think about that, you really need to be careful as an investor that you are only taking your cues from people who are playing the same game that you are. Because if the market is being pushed around, prices are being pushed up and down by day traders in a way that is very rational for them. It makes sense for them to buy or sell based off of these signals. But you are, but you as a long-term investor are taking your cues from them. And you're saying, well, the stock went up, so maybe I should buy it. Maybe they know something I don't. That's when it gets dangerous. So when you're taking your cues from someone who is playing a different game than you are, even though they're playing on the same field as you, that's when you get into trouble. There's things like, if you look at condos in Miami during the housing bubble around 2005, 2006, a very large percentage of those condos were owned for less than 60 days at a time. People were literally day trading condos and it made sense for them to do it. It was rational for them to do it because they were making money doing it. There was momentum in the prices. It made sense. The danger is when you had people who came in and said, oh, prices are going up, so I should buy a condo to hold for the next 10 years. Those are the people who are left holding the bag because they took their cues from people who are playing a different game than we were. Yeah. Do you mind if I share with you a few of the other specific facts or insights that I found pretty profound? And then maybe if you feel so inclined, you could elaborate a little bit more on them. Please, let's do it. Okay. okay. So one of them was this about savings. So, okay, let me start with lottery tickets. <laughs> that one blew my mind. So you include this pretty early in the book that Americans spend more money on lottery tickets than movies, video games, music, sporting events, and books combined. Yes. It, that's true. That's, that's true. true. But, that... you, but, you, but, but you, you're probably going to say the next part of it, which is why people like you and I don't realize that. Yeah. Which is that the vast majority of those lottery tickets are purchased, the vast, vast majority are purchased by the poorest set of Americans, income people who are in the lowest decile of income, spend on average $400 per year on lottery tickets. These are people for whom they literally struggle to feed themselves based off of the income that they have, and they are dumping an incredible amount of money into scratcher tickets every week. And now people like you and I and a lot of the listeners to this will look at that and say, that's crazy. Shaking our head, why would they do that? Are they stupid? Do they not understand what's going on here? And, and, and maybe that is the right answer. That is the right advice to give to those people. You're making a huge mistake here that you should stop doing. Maybe that is the right answer. But I make the point in the book that if you try to really empathize and put yourself in their shoes, you might get to something like this. People who are in the lowest decile of income might feel that they do not have a lot of career opportunities to advance. They might not feel like their ability to move up the ladder into a much higher paying job where there's an opportunity in front of them and a real clear path for their career to succeed and move ahead. If they don't feel that that exists for them, then hold, buying a lottery ticket and holding that lottery ticket might be the only time in their life that they have a feeling of saying, this is my literally my ticket to the other side. This is the thing that's going to get me out of my current situation. If other people have that feeling because they get from their job, if I perform well in my job, I'll get promoted. I'll get more income. If they get that feeling from that, 
Well, people who don't have that sense might only be able to get that sense of joy, that sense of optimism about the future from a lottery ticket. And this is just another example of the point I made earlier about no one is crazy. People do crazy things with their money. But a lot of the things that people like you and I and other people will look at others and say, you're making a crazy decision with your money. Well, maybe it actually works for them inside of their head in that moment. Buying that lottery ticket actually works for them. Yeah. And you make this point about we are not coldly analytical decision makers always doing what's most rational driven by a spreadsheet. But instead, we make these decisions around the, the dinner table and in meetings, you know, and things like that. That definitely rings true <laughs> with me as much as we want to have all these tidy economic theories, you know, that that's often not the case. Every basis of economic theory is based off of the point, the, the, the assumption that people are perfectly rational and make deci rational decisions that maximize the utility of their income. And in the real world, that's just bonkers. People make their decisions with their money at the dinner table or in a conference room with their coworkers, or even if you're single, just you know, inside of your head trying to figure out how you feel in that given moment, in that given day, which is just this idea that people should not even try to be rational with their money, I think. I think what people should aim to be is reasonable with their money and realize that there are things that people do that make no sense on paper, that you cannot rationalize on paper, but they make sense for them. They're very reasonable for them. And if you can aim to, if, you're, if your North Star is to be as reasonable as you can with your money, that I think is the best that anyone can hope to do. Because I don't think anyone can be coldly rational with their money in the way that they are coldly rational about arithmetic. Because money is emotional for everyone. Some people are more emotional about it than others. But in the same way that it's impossible to not be emotional about your kids, of course you're emotional about your kids. Of course you want the best for them. Of course you're sad when they fail, et cetera, et cetera. No one can be just coldly unemotional and rational about their children. Kids are emotional. Relationships are emotional. And I think money is as well for virtually everyone. So you should just embrace the fact that it's emotional and realize that being coldly rational is virtually impossible to do all the time. And therefore just aim to be pretty reasonable, as reasonable as you can with your financial decisions. Yeah. Then another thing, and I was reading this to our, my 13 year old son at dinner last night, trying to help him really grasp just how powerful compound interest can be. The, the way you put this in chapter four, this is for me, sometimes numbers are a little hard to read and process, but I think if we start with this, that at the time of writing here, time of publication, Warren Buffett's net worth was $84.5 billion. And then you write 81.5 billion of his 84.5 billion net worth came after his 65th birthday. Right. And he right. just turned 90, I think. He just turned 90. So in this, this is like the hypothetical thought experiment that we have. So Warren Buffett started investing at age 10 and he continues today through age 90. If you, hypo if you hypothetically say, well, let's imagine a world in which he started investing at 25, like a normal person, and he retired at 65, like a normal person, you would have never heard of him. Even if he earned the same annual investing returns during that period, you would have never heard of him. His net worth would have been something like $11 million, would have been a wealthy man, but nothing spectacular in the slightest. The reason he has a household name, the reason he's one of the richest men in the world is just because of the amount of time he has been investing for. And that's so easy to overlook in investing because when people look at Warren Buffett, they say, well, how has he invested? What is his secret? How does he think about businesses? How does he think about management teams and moats and investing strategies, et cetera? All of which is good and important. But we know that literally 99% of Warren Buffett's success is just tied to the amount of the fact that he's been investing for three quarters of a century. That's what it is. His skill is investing, but his secret is time. And I think that explanation is just way too simple for people to take seriously, which is why most books that are on the subject of how did Warren Buffett do it go into these grand details about his investing strategy when the, the, the title of the, of the ultimate Warren Buffett book should just be called, This Guy Has Been Investing for 75 Years. That's all the book <laughs> needs to be. That's Because yeah. that's the single most salient point that explains his success. Yeah. And then for most of us mere mortals who, you know, we didn't start when we were 10 and we haven't had whatever the, the relationships and the good decision-making and the good fortune that someone like Warren Buffett has had. And we're just looking to be reasonable with our money, make good choices, have nice vacations, put our kids through school, things like that. The point you make and the way you talk about it, about savings, I know it's one of those things that's not sexy. Like it's probably not cool. But when you talk about, and I, I just love the way you frame this, when you say, since you can build wealth without a high income, which is already not intuitive for a lot of people, 
Like, what do you mean I can build wealth without a high income? I got to have a big salary. I got to have a big passive income. But you say, since you can build wealth without a high income, but have no chance of building wealth without a high savings rate, it's clear which one matters more. Right. I mean, this will seem so obvious when I say it, but if you make $50,000 a year and you spend 30, you are going to build more wealth than someone who makes a million dollars a year and spends a million dollars a year. Of course, that is so, that's the most basic arithmetic, but that point is often lost on people. The variable that makes all the difference in the world is your savings rate, not necessarily your income. And you would be shocked, or maybe not shocked, maybe people realize this, but how many people have a very good income, they make a lot of money, they make $500,000 a year, a million dollars a year, and they're broke because they spend all of it versus versus how many people spend make $50,000 a year and spend 30. And if they compound that over 20, 30, 40 years, they're wealthy. So that's really what matters most. And what's so important is that your savings rate is in your control. What the stock market does is not in your control. What the economy does is not in your control. What the company you work for by and large is not in your control. Your savings rate largely is, not, not 100% because life throws you curveballs, people have different needs and whatnot, but if you can suppress your ego again to this level that, may, that leads to a higher savings rate, that is the lever that you have control over in your finances that gives you the highest chance of building legitimate wealth over time. And since it's in your control, that should be really optimistic for people. Like there's there's something that you can do today to increase your odds of building wealth over time that does not rely on investing in the stock market or the gains that may or may not come from that. It's something that you can do today. Yeah, I know. It's like savings for money feels like what sleep is for physical health. Again, it's yes. there's no secret to it. It's not necessarily sexy, but it just works. <laughs> it, it works. Here's another another example of that with physical health. There are a lot of studies that have made this point of, look, Americans actually exercise a lot. They go to the gym a lot. They work out a lot. They lift a lot of weights. They spend a tremendous amount of money, not just on gym memberships, but actually going to the gym. But they're also very obese. Even the people who spend a lot of money working out are obese. And why is that? If they're working out so much, why can't they lose weight? The studies that I've looked into is make this really obvious point, which is that the majority of people, if you go to the gym and burn a thousand calories, will right after that workout, go home and eat 1100 calories. It's not that it's not that people are not working out enough or not exercising enough. By and large, they are, but they compensate for that on the other end of it. And it's very similar in finance. It's not that most people don't earn enough money to, sa to save over time. It's that they are compensating for that. Where if, if they get a raise and their income goes from 50,000 to 60,000, but their material aspirations rise by the similar amount, of course, you're going to go nowhere. You're just compensating for whatever you made. So it's the same thing in health. You can exercise all day long, but if you go straight from the gym to McDonald's, it doesn't matter. It's the same with money. You can make money all day long, but unless you're suppressing your ego enough to have a legitimate savings rate, it's not going to matter. It's not going to improve your situation over time. Yeah. I suspect, I, I hope, but and I suspect that someone, at least one person listening to this, although they will have known this, they'll have heard it before, that this will be the light bulb moment that they're like, oh, okay, that's me. It's the point in my life or whatever that I'm going to do it. And then they make the commitment to peg it to a percentage or an amount every month or whatever. And I, again, I love the how succinctly and clearly you say this later in the book where you say, save, just save. You don't need a specific reason to save. Right. Right. Because as much as saving can be about wealth building, sometimes it's just about having that reserve for when life happens. It's just this acknowledgement that the world is, if you, if you have, pay any attention to history, history, there's a famous historian named Arnold Toynbee who says history is just one damn thing after another. And that's what history, history is a continuous chain of setback and disaster and disappointment and regret and error and breakages constantly. That's all of it. Look, we've made a tremendous amount of progress over time, but at any, any given year, any given month, there are things going wrong all over the world. So if you accept that, then you just realize that you as an individual or a business owner need to have an adequate level of savings to endure the constant never-ending chain of disappointment and destruction that exists in the world. That is just an inevitable part of life. So a lot of people, when they are they, when they think about savings, they think about a specific goal. I need to save for a new car. I need to save for retirement, save to put my kids through college, which is great. But I think if you just realize that the world is filled with challenges, the majority of which are unforeseeable and unknowable, then you need to just save. You just need to have a buffer to save for the fact that life throws you banana peels all the time. That's what you need to save for. Just you're, you're, you're saving for things that you cannot think about. The biggest risk in the economy is always what nobody is talking about. 
the things that we are talking about that are visible in the news, it's not that they're not risky, but we can prepare for them. We can ex we, you know, both psychologically and financially prepare for them. The things that really move the needle historically are the things that are completely unforeseeable and therefore no one is talking about and therefore no one is prepared for. COVID-19, September 11th, Pearl Harbor. Those are the things that really move the needle over time, the things that no one can see coming. And that's what you need to prepare for. You need to, pre you need to save and prepare for things that you could not possibly envision with the information that you have today. Yeah. And on the other side, while everything you've said 100% is so true, there's also the ability to capitalize on opportunity when it presents itself that you wouldn't otherwise right. be able yeah. to do. You know, it's really, if you think particularly these days, if you save money and keep it in the bank and you look at it and you say, okay, I'm earning 0.01% interest, like where is the opportunity in that? Well, you're right that that's meaningless and it's, it's, a tiny, it's a tiny return that you're getting on your investment. But if that cash in the bank gives you an option to do something when opportunity presents itself, either an investing opportunity that you can buy or a career opportunity to join another company that might have a lower salary, whatever it is, then the actual return that you are earning on that cash, it was actually significantly higher because it gave you options. It had optionality value that's hard to measure. It's impossible to measure what that value is going to be in the future. But oftentimes when you look in hindsight, you will, you will look and say, hey, that the return on my cash that I thought was earning 0.1%, it actually turned out to be the best investing I, investment I ever made because it gave me this option. It gave me this flexibility to do something else in the future. Yeah. Which comes right back to that, the highest form of wealth, being able to do what you want when you want. Right. So, you know, another thing that I didn't realize, I don't spend a lot of time looking at, you know, financial reports and economic forecasts and things. So I didn't know this, but the debt to income ratio in the United States that blew my mind. It's high. Pretty, you know, at, at, at the personal level, we have gone, we've, we've added a lot of debt at the household level in the last 40 or 50 years. There's some, you know, the theory that I kind of put forth in this ties it back to growing wealth inequality. And to really sum, summarize it really quickly, I go into a lot more depth in it in the book. It's that for about the 20 years after World War II ended, most people in America grew together. The incomes of poor people grew about the same rate as the incomes of wealthy people. Well, there, there are always wealthier people than uh, people who are wealthier than others, but their incomes grew at roughly the same rate. And also there was much more similarities in terms of how people live their lives. Rich people drove Cadillacs and regular people drove Chevys, but the difference between those two vehicles was not that much. And rich people lived in homes that were 3,000 square feet and normal people lived in homes that were 2,500 square feet. Like the differences weren't that much. And then starting around 1980, it really started growing apart and the wealthier got way wealthier and everyone else kind of flatlined at best, if not declined over time. If you look at male earnings adjusted for inflation, they have gone down over the last 30 or 40 years. At the same time, for male median earnings, I should say, at the same time where a small subset of very wealthy people, their wealth surged during that period. And I think what that created is it just inflate, the, the rise of very, very wealthy people inflated the aspirations of more average people. And the only way that the average people could keep up was through debt. That was the only way that they felt like they could keep up with people who were there seeing around them was to say, well, if that person is living in a nicer house, I deserve a nicer house too. But the only way I can get that nicer house is to have a bigger mortgage. And oh, well, they're sending their daughter to Pepperdine. I want to send my daughter to Pepperdine. But the only way I can do that is to take out $200,000 in student loans. That is a lot of what happened is you had people's aspirations grew much faster. Let's say the median aspiration grew much faster than the median income. And the only way to fill that gap was through debt. That is at least one explanation for why household debt has increased so rapidly over the last 30 or 40 years, particularly in two areas, mortgages and student loans. Those are the areas that have just really surged to incredible levels over the last 20 or 30 years. Yeah. And what you said, the last part, you call it a postscript in the book. It's about 17 pages of a brief history of why the United States consumer thinks the way they do. It's, a, it's the postscript, but it's actually the longest chapter in the book. <laughs> yeah. And I thought it was so insightful and, and hear of what you're talking about, again, because we live in this society, but we aren't necessarily aware as individuals of the facts that we're living inside, right? And when you say between 1993 and 2012, the top 1% saw their incomes grow 86.1%, while the bottom 99% saw just a 6.6% .6 growth. So it's massive disparity. And that these lifestyles are, you know, that that dissonance between them is magnified by social media in some ways, 
It allows us to see inside each other's lives in a way we never have before. How sizes have grown, I had no idea. Where you say that the average new American home has more bathrooms than occupants and nearly half have four or more bedrooms, which is up from just 18% about 30 years ago. It's about nearly 40 years ago now. But then the bottom line of all of it, because it's like, okay, yeah, this, the home sizes have grown, the income gap has grown. Okay, so what? But then for me, and I don't tend to worry a lot. I don't feel a lot of anxiety. But this one paragraph you wrote about the Tea Party, Occupy Wall Street, Brexit, and Donald Trump each represents a group shouting, stop the ride I want off. The details of their shouting are different, but they're all shouting at least in part because stuff isn't working for them within the context of the post-war expectation that stuff should work roughly the same for everyone. And I was like, because I think I've had this fantasy that we're going to get through the election, everything's going to normalize. And I don't know, now I don't think that's going to happen. There are much deeper structural problems that explain some of the political developments of the last five or 10 years. And those, the deep roots of those problems are not only have they not been touched, but hey, since I wrote this book, I finished writing the book in January before COVID, which is why COVID's not really mentioned in there. But look, if wealth inequality was, I think, the biggest social economic story of the last 30 years, and it was, well, wealth inequality was kind of, you know, I'm going to do this visually, it was growing apart for the last 30 years. In 2020, it just blew way apart. Because now in 2020, you have at the same time when roughly 40 or 50% of Americans are struggling more than ever before, literally equivalent to the Great Depression or worse in some industries. If you own a restaurant or if you work in the airline industry, it's worse than the Great Depression. While at the same time, you have stocks surging to all-time highs. And people who, and businesses who can work from home, operate their business from, from home, a lot of those companies are not only okay, they're doing better than ever. And therefore, the gap between the haves and the haves nots is growing so far apart right now. And then so that stop the train, it's not working for me anymore, is way deeper today than it was even when I wrote the book. Because it's just in the last four or five months, it's really spread apart very quickly. Yeah, it's amazing. I think you just tweeted or retweeted someone's about Zoom is now worth more than IBM. Yes. It's like, yeah. holy cow. This is why it's like, it's getting close to being more than worth more than ExxonMobil, which used to be the most valuable company in the world. It's Amazing. so much changed so quickly in the last six or nine months. And so many people have benefited from that in enormous ways at the same time when another subset of Americans, but a big subset, tens of millions of people are struggling more than ever and will continue to struggle because, you know, it was one thing if COVID was a one month story, as we kind of thought it would be in February or March, it would be okay because the businesses that had to shut down if it was a one month story, they could have reopened, hired everyone back and would have been okay. The longer this continues though, the more businesses are gonna be shut for good. And then whenever this is quote unquote over, whenever that is, however you wanna define that, there's not gonna be businesses that can just bring back the workers that they laid off. It creates a permanent damage that again, just exacerbates the some people are struggling to feed themselves while other people are just have surging wealth that seems to know no limits. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Well, I know we've covered a lot and I, I appreciate you indulging my personal curiosity on so many of the insights that resonated with me. And I know there's so much more in the book. I hope people listening pick this up. What they might not get that is also part of the book, just from the 35 or 40 minutes of conversation we've had, is the stories that you tell, which I think are brilliant, well told to bring these points to life, drive them home, you know, that kind of thing. But before we transition... Again, I know we've covered a lot, but is there anything that we didn't talk about either that's in the book or related to to money or life that you want you want to touch on before we move on to the lightning lightning round? No, I think we 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 covered a lot of bases. People will will get hopefully different things out of the book, but hopefully there's something in there for everyone that will make them think a little bit differently about their money. Yeah, I I think so. Okay, then with that, I'll go ahead and move us over. So again, a series of questions on a variety of topics. You're welcome to answer as long as you want. For my part, my aim is to ask the question and by and large, just stand aside. Okay. All right. Question number one, please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a seasonal shifts in weather. Sometimes it's very nice. Sometimes it's brutal, but you know, the seasons are going to end. You know, they're going to come. They shouldn't surprise you. They come and go the good times, the bad times, the blizzards and the sunny days, you know, they're going to happen. And you also know that they're going to eventually end. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Question number two. Here, I'm borrowing Peter Thiel's famous question. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? Oh, good. Good question. Let me think about this for a second. 
If there's one to bring it back to the book, it's that people should not be rational with their money. They should be reasonable. I think even the people who might nod their heads when they hear that think, okay, that's cute, but no, you should try to be rational with your money. I so firmly believe that that's not right, that people should not necessarily maximize their finances to earn the highest returns, that they should maximize for how well they sleep at night, which is going to be different for everyone. But I think that's a much more reasonable framework to work with. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. And I just want to call this out now as well, which I really enjoyed and appreciate it as well, is the last chapter you saved was confessions, what you do with your own money and how you personally think about money, which... Yeah, I, I, I didn't include any numbers, but I really just opened the kimono about what my wife and I do with our own personal money. Yeah. And, and part of that, spoiler alert, is you own your home. Right. We own our home outright with no mortgage, which I read in the book is the worst financial decision we've ever made because you can borrow money so cheaply these days. But it's the best money decision we've ever made. It's the one thing we've done with our money where we looked at each other and often said, oh my gosh, I can't believe we did it. This house is ours. It's a level of stability and security. No one can take it from us. This is ours. That makes us feel so good about it, so good about our decision, even if we cannot ever justify it on a spreadsheet. A lot of people, when they read that, have asked me on these podcasts, how can you justify that? How can you rationalize it? And I even write in the book, I say, I can't. And I'm not going to. I don't feel any need to. I do it because it makes us feel good. And that's all that matters to us. And that's all we're going to do. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Question number three. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? I had a baseball hat when I was probably 13 that said simple. And it was there. I think there was a skate company called simple. I don't know if it's around anymore, but the hat just said simple. And I love that. I don't have it anymore. But I, I think that's what it would be. Those. Yeah. I, I, remember I, 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 I think it was a shoe company, which I yeah, didn't I even so. know. I just love the hat. Yeah. But I, I think that would be my model. Just keeping things as simple as possible with as few knobs to fiddle with, I think is a good life philosophy. Great. Question number four, what book other than your own have you gifted or recommended most often? Probably recommend it. It's, it's a book written by an American historian named Frederick Lewis Allen. He wrote it. He wrote it in the 1950s. The book is called The Big Change. And it's about how America changed culturally from 1900 to 1950, which the amount of change, technological and social change that took place from 1900 to 1950 is probably an order of magnitude more than what took place from 1950 to 2000. I mean, in 1900, it was horse and buggies. And by 1950, it was jets. Versus from two, from 1950 to 2000, we went from jet to faster jet. It was like the, the, it wasn't that there weren't changes from 1950 to 2000. There were big ones, but the changes that took place from 1900 to 1950 were so transformational that it was just a completely different world within one generation. And he writes so eloquently about what that did to people's lives and how it changed their lives. It's such a fascinating book. Wow! Right on. Thank you for that. Question number five. So you've traveled a lot in your life. What's one travel hack, meaning something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? Look, the serious answer, although I'll give you something different from this, is sleeping pills. It's the only way that I can get through jet lag. I did, oh, did pre-COVID, I did a lot of international travel. The only way that I can be a functional human being is to drug myself to sleep with over-the-counter pills. Don't get crazy about it. But I think, uh, so here's, here's another practical thing that I do, though. In any city that I go to, I like to put on my headphones and just walk in a random direction. No goal, no destination. I just want to walk through neighborhoods and see what life is for like the ordinary people in that area. It's not that I don't go to the, the tourist traps. I like those as much as anyone else, but I like to see just what the normal area is life. So no path, no destination. Put on my headphones, listen to some music and just go for a five mile walk. I love doing that. I know. All right. Question number six. What's one thing you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? We just moved to Seattle four months ago. We used to live in Washington, D.C., and our new house has a home gym in it, and I like to use it every day, and I honestly, I feel so much better. Everything. I feel like I sleep better. I feel like I'm in a better mood because I'm working out more than I did in the past. So that's been, that's been a, a even though we're only three or four months into it, I, I already feel so much better. That's great. And you'll live longer. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Number seven, what's one thing you wish every American knew? Reasonable people can disagree. People who have the same education and the same information can and will always will come to different conclusions about really fundamental topics. And that just because people disagree with you or you disagree with them or they disagree with you doesn't mean they're bad people, doesn't mean you actually disagree. Again, usually what that reflects is that you have seen the world through a different lens. You have different experiences and you value different things in life. Yeah. I wish every American knew that as well. <laughs> Number eight. What's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about making relationships work? 
I have a friend named Brent Bishore who once told me that as as a husband, or you could just say as a spouse, he said he he said he's in the service business. He is there to serve. He is not there to be waited upon. He's not there to wait for his spouse, his wife, but you can make this about either gender. He's not there for, for his wife to make his life better. He is there to serve her. And if both people in the relationship have that mindset that I am there to serve the other person so that it's equal, you're both there to make the other person's life better, to help them out whenever they need help. That is, I think, a great way to grow a relationship, but it only works if there's equality in that, that both people think they're in the service industry. If one person does and the other person doesn't, you're going to have a problem. Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay. And question number nine, and this is a standard part of this question set. So I apologize if it sounds a little unfair, but it's aside from compound interest, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money or what's something you're always sure to do with it or never do with it? I think to me, the most important thing about money is let's just confine this to the stock market is the history of volatility. It is perfectly normal and average for the stock market to lose 30% of its value once or twice per decade. That's the normal path. And whenever it does lose 30% of its value, people stop and say, this is wrong. Something feels broken. This can't be how it's supposed to work. I want to get out because the stock market's broken. Even though if you look historically, that is the normal path of long-term growth. It's not intuitive at all, but I think that's the most important part of investing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then question number 10 is if people want to learn more from you or if they want to connect with you, what would you have them do? I mean, most of what I write, I should say everything that I write and a lot of my thoughts are on Twitter. It's where I spend most of my time. That is my technology drug of choice these days. So my on Twitter, my handle is my first and last name, Morgan Housel. That's where I spend most of my time. Awesome. Okay. That's great. And as a thank you, and if, if you're up for it, I, I still have a few questions about writing and, and creativity, just a few. But before we go to that, I do want to say this here, that as a thank you for making time to share your insight and your knowledge and wisdom with me and everybody listening, I've gone to the micro lending site, kiva.org, and I have made a $100 micro loan to a woman in Kyrgyzstan named Aina, who will use this money. She actually works in animal husbandry and agriculture. And she's going to use this to, to raise animals that she will then sell their products to improve the quality of life for herself, her family, and people in her community. Well, thank you. That's very, that's so meaningful to me. I really appreciate that. And let's both of us high five for Ina that she's going to be in a little bit better spot today. So thank you. That's meaningful. Yeah. That's my pleasure. Okay. So coming down the stretch on the interview here, I just want to say this is less of a question and more of a, a statement. I always cheer a little bit when I find someone who has a flourishing, what I see at least as a flourishing career as a blogger, because it's easy to think, oh, blogging, isn't that like ancient history? <laughs> <laughs> but you're very active and your blogs, I find to be very insightful. I just read the one, I think you barely published about Bill Gates was interviewed and called a genius and things like this. But let me ask you, like, how do you see how do you see blogging and how do you see yourself as a writer? Like, how does that work? How do you or organize your life around and thoughts around writing and sharing them like this, like you do? I think, you know, for one, I've been doing this full time professionally for 14 years. So it's, you know, it's very different if you're just getting started blogging. And it took me, if I've been writing for 14 years, I feel like it took me 10 years to gain any sort of momentum. You know, it was a lot of just writing into the echo chamber for a long time when no one was paying attention. Not an easy thing to do. It's easy to kind of, you know, sap your self-confidence when you do it that way. But it, it takes a lot of time to build an audience, to get people's attention. Particularly, there are so many blogs out there that, you know, consumers have just a lot of choice. And so to get them to, you know, come towards you is a difficult thing to do. But I view my job and the job of every blogger is to just try to understand how the world works, come up with a few insights and explain them in a way that is easy and digestible and fun for people to learn. That's the really important part. A lot of people out there have great, brilliant insights, but where a lot of people struggle in the writing field is communicating them in a way that is exciting and interesting and fast enough for your anxious, time-constrained reader to put up with. The huge majority of readers, myself included, I think virtually everyone, they are so impatient when they read. And if they read, a, they open up a blog, if it hasn't caught their attention in three seconds, they're gone. They're like out. Literally something else, three seconds or less. Literally three seconds. They have something else to read. You got to get out there. So you really have to, when you're thinking about that, it's like, how can I grab someone's attention really quickly, but not grab their attention in a way that is flagrant and just, you know, grabbing your attention with something provocative, but is ridiculous. You can't do it that. You really got to capture their attention where, where people say, oh, this is interesting. I, I want to keep reading this. Really hard thing to do, but it's it's the most important part of the blogging. And it's definitely more of an art than a skill. It's not something you can say, oh, 
the way you do that is with X, Y, and Z. It's just not, it's not like that. It's much more of a, an art of trying to hone that skill. And it's something that no one is an expert at. Even people who've been doing it forever, it's something that they always have to work with, to work at. Yeah. Well, and I, I got the sense in reading The Psychology of Money that you know, you're a student, obviously, of history, but you're also, you seem to be a student of science. And part of what I love about your writing is that you're able to introduce these things that happen in the natural world or that have happened in another time and place and to help explain a concept or bring it to life. And so where this, where I'm attempting to formulate this in a question is as a writer and a reader, how is it that you, as you kind of scoop up material, like a whale getting plankton, and you file it away, you organize it, and then you draw upon it to, to bring these things to life. How do, you, how do you go about that? I think the first thing is, I, like, I'm a financial writer, but I almost never read finance books. I don't read investing books. Because to me, investing is, is not the study of finance. Investing is a study of how people behave with money. And since it's this behavioral field, it incorporates all these other things that have nothing to do with investing, that you can learn from things like medicine and science and military history and politics, sociology, psychology, poly, all these other fields that deal with this overarching theme of how do people make decisions? How do people behave around scarcity, greed, and fear? That's what you can. That's the best way for me to learn about investing. So I try to cast a really wide net when I read read and read from as many different fields as I can, but always with this, this tickle in my head of, does this remind me of something about investing? As I'm reading about this biology study or this, you know, medical study, whatever it is, does this remind me about something that, that deals with the same topic of how people deal with money? So if I'm, if you cast a wide net and you're always thinking, you know, through that lens, I think you will start to pick up other areas in life that just start to remind you about something with money. And then when you sit down to write your article, and then you can just kind of start pulling from the mental library that you have of, oh, that reminds me of something I read about this. And that, rem oh, and now that I say that, that kind of reminds me of this other study that might fit in here. If you just have such a big, wide variety of information in your head from your wide variety of reading, then it's just easier to piece all those things together. Yeah. I know that some authors like Ryan Holiday or Robert Greene will actually create something like a commonplace book where they've made physical cards, or at least they've, you know, other authors will have an online, you know, they'll tag them. Tim Ferriss will do things in Evernote and things like this. Do you have any kind of a process, either physical or digital, that you're actually tagging and filing different things? Or is, for you, is it just a mental? It's mostly just a mental, but that's not, that's not good or by design. I wish I was more organized. I have one Google Doc titled Neat Stuff. That sometimes when I come across something that I think is neat, I'll just copy and paste it into there. But it's not organized at all. It's not comprehensive in the slightest. I wish I was more organized in that sense. I would have better stories, better anecdotes if I was. But it's 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 maybe something I should work on. But there's not a lot to say because I, I I I'm I'm not very organized in that sense. Yeah. Well, what you're doing, I think I think is working from one reader's view. <laughs> Well, thank you. Let me ask you this. How do you organize your time as a writer? Do you write every day? Do you have routines? How do you, how do you work within a structure of time? I think what's important is that all writing is a creative process and creativity cannot be scheduled. You can't just put a calendar entry on your calendar that says at 855, I'm going to come up with a creative idea to write about. It doesn't work that way. And actually, the more you try to force it and the more you try to schedule it, the worse you're going to do. The best ideas that people come up with are in the shower or when they're commuting to work or going for a walk or just these, you know, sitting on the, on the couch daydreaming, that's when people come up with good ideas. So the vast majority of my weeks, my days are just unstructured reading and going for walks and thinking, which doesn't look like work. It doesn't feel like work, but that's when you come up with good ideas to write about. Yeah. That reminds me of the scene in Mad Men when Don Draper's boss comes in and he's lying on the couch and he says, you know, I never get over the fact that most of the time when I come here, it looks like you're doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> I love that. I, I, I heard that, but it's such a yeah. big philosophy of mine is that good work often looks like lazy work if you're working with your head. And then, which was not the case for most workers a hundred years ago, where a hundred years ago, virtually everyone doing work meant laboring with your hands, digging, working in the farm, working in a factory, where so many of the jobs we have these days are thought jobs where your job is to come up with a good idea. It's to use your brain. And people use their brain doing things that don't look like work, like sitting on the couch with your eyes closed. Looks like you're taking a nap, but no, I'm actually doing the best work that I can. Yeah. Well, the final question here then is what advice or encouragement would you leave anyone listening with who is either in the process of completing their own book or they haven't started yet for whatever reason? 
What advice and encouragement? Keep chipping away at it. Look, the vast majority of people with a high school education or even less know how to write. But good writing takes a lot of work, a lot of practice, like anything else. It's gonna, if you're doing it consistently, then it's gonna take you 10 years to really gain a big proficiency at it. So, and that's hard for people to, to grasp because people know that they, they don't know how to fly an airplane or they don't know how to perform open heart surgery because they haven't been taught that. But everyone, most people can write, but getting to be a good writer is a completely different field. So it just takes a lot of time, a lot of practice of chipping away at it. Okay. Well, Morgan, thank you again for making time to talk with me. I know I said this, I love your book. I'm so glad we've connected. Looking forward to helping you get the word out about this. So anyway, I don't know when and where our paths will cross again, but I'm sure they will at some point and I will look forward to that day. Thank you so much, Brilliant. This has been an honor to be here. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, I'll talk to you later. Okay, take care. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life isn't working for many people. Whether it's in the developed world, where we're dealing with depression, anxiety, addiction, divorce, jobs we hate, relationships that don't work, or people in the developing world who don't have access to clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or who live in conflict zones, there's a lot of people on the planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, I invite you to connect with me at goodliving.com. I've created Life's Best Practices Breakthrough Coaching to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated school, you're going through a divorce, you just got married, you're headed into retirement, you're starting a business, you just lost your job, whatever it is you're facing, I've developed a 36-week course that you go through with me and a community of achievers and seekers who are committed to improving their own lives and the lives of others. So through this online program, you will have the opportunity to go deep into every area of your life, explore life's big questions, create answers for yourself in community get clarity and accountability. If that's something you're interested to learn about, I invite you to contact me directly at brian at briamiller.com or by visiting goodliving.com.